Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to our 14th Get to Know Your State Forest webinar. Um, my name is Sarah Corcoran. I use she, her pronouns. I'm the deputy director for the Pennsylvania chapter of the Sierra Club. Um, I'm also sitting in the role today as the coordinator for the Safe Pennsylvania Forest Coalition. So those are the folks that have been putting on this webinar series. Um, when I share out the recording from today's webinar in a few days, I will also share a link to the recordings from all of our previous webinars. So you'll be able to learn a little bit more about the other forest districts that we have had the opportunity to learn more about. So today we have a few foresters from Elk State Forest out in North, uh, it's like right in between Northwestern and North Central Pennsylvania. It's still considered the PA wild. So we'll say within the PA wilds region. Um, and they are going to tell us all about their forest district today. So um, without further ado, well, actually with a little bit more further ado, a little bit more in the way of housekeeping, um, as I said, this is going to be recorded, so please make sure that you have your video and your audio off during the presentation today. And um, we will have about 10 to 15 minutes at the end of our presentation today for a Q&A session. So if there are any questions that you have throughout the presentation, you can go ahead and put them in the chat at the bottom. Um, that's the little the little message bubble in there. So um, you can put any, any questions you have in the chat and I will read them off at the end of the presentation. So we don't have to worry about folks coming on and off mute to, to ask their questions. Um, we also have closed captioning enabled for today. So if you would like to take um, advantage of closed captioning at the bottom of your screen, you'll see a little closed caption button that you can click on as well to enable that. Um, all right, so now without further ado, I'm gonna pass it over to the folks from Elk State Forest to introduce themselves and their state forest district. Thank you, Sarah. First of all, I wanted to say welcome everybody and to say thank you for taking your lunch, and lunch hour to be with us. Um, we're really proud of the work we do here on the state forest and in the surrounding area. We are a group of four foresters that you're going to see talk today. So I'm not sure what you know about foresters. We're probably not known for our public speaking, but we are really proud of the work we do. So hopefully you can get past our bad public speaking, in my case at least, and hear the good message that we have. We, we put together what we hope is a good presentation for you to get to know the elk, just so that you're on the same page and you, you realize the path that we're going to go down we're gonna do four topics today, the four different speakers. The first is be the overview of the Elk Forest District, and that's by me. Second would be uh, recreation on the forest by Forester Sam Johnson. We'll have a talk about natural gas management and severed rights by Forester Charlie Kirkpatrick. And then we'll do a discussion about conservation easements by District Forester Joe Keller. And like Sarah said, at the end of that, there'll be time for questions and answers. So who is me? I'm Wade Kistler. I'm an assistant district manager here. Um, I'm in charge of the resource management side of things. So what that means is I supervise foresters, forest technicians, and also there's a, a regeneration crew of maintenance staff uh, equipment operators. Um, I put the slide up to show that's a picture of one of my children next to a sign on our forest. So I think I speak for all four of us up here. It's not like we come to work and then when we leave, we're done with the state forest system. It's part of the, how we live up here. And uh, I know my children probably will not stay here forever, but they're gonna remember how much time we spend on the state forest. I've worked for the Bureau for over 26 years now. So you've had some of these discussions already from other districts. I worked in the Rothrock State Forest, which is in Huntington near State College. And then I worked on the Susquehannock up in Cowdersport, and now I work here. So my district overview, what I need to talk about today, and I'm hoping when I'm done talking that you can answer three questions. There won't be a test, but hopefully you get enough information from me that we can answer three things together. So where and what is the Elk State Forest? Who works here? How do we staff this place? And what do those people do? 
I thought it best, you know, Sarah did a pretty good description of where we are in the world, but if you can see, if you can focus and see the red on the map, the red is where the Elk State Forest is. Um, the other colors are state-owned lands around us. So you can see Potter County has a big state forest. That's the light green. And the gray is a lot of game lands. Um, I should draw attention to the fact I put at the bottom a really good website, a web resource, and I left it up for the next few slides of my presentation. And maybe we can offer it again in the chat too. But if you use that link and you type in what we hope is the Elk State Forest, you'll get a ton of useful information more than we could ever you know, talk about in an hour. You could search that for, for a really long time. And you could also print your own maps and some are a geo reference so you could have them on your phone and not get lost if you come visit us. Um, so that, that's gonna be at the bottom of the next few slides. If you need it later, just let us know. So that was the general map. Um, I tried to zoom in and I tried to display something that we went from red for the Elk State Forest, now it's the dark green. And if you can see Cameron County is, is what envelops most of the, or half of the Elk State Forest basically is half of Cameron County. Um, I tried to put some other landmarks on there and you can see the Clearfield County, Elk County, uh, McKean County, we're in all of those, we're in Potter County. The most interesting, so I guess what I'm trying to say is it's, it's hard to display a map of the Elk State Forest just because it's 217,000 acres and it covers parts, portions of five counties, right? So I know that's complicated, maybe hard to see on your computer screen, but that, that's kind of what we live with here. It's such a big, vast resource, it's hard to map on one picture. The most interesting thing to me about the Forest District is it's part of three different eco, eco regions that they're the high plateau, the Pittsburgh low plateau and the deep valleys eco region. And I think if you would ever take a drive through here, especially in the fall, maybe you'd be able to see those different eco regions because really it affects the timber resource a lot. If you start in the northern part of our district, it's a lot of northern hardwoods, which are cherry, sugar maple, beech. And by the time you get to the southern part of our district, it's mostly oak, hickory type. And in between there, the most interesting thing, you know, is, is the transition area grows some of the nicest red oak in the world because the soils are good and the, and the oak doesn't normally get a chance to grow on such good soils. So how did we get this land base? I think it's pretty similar to the other large chunks of public land that are up in the Pennsylvania wilds. Um, so the first purchase for the Elk State Forest was in, actually in 1900. And the land was done being used by large timber companies. Most everything that was reachable was cut. Um, no, nobody really wanted to have that fire danger or the erosion hazard or that tax base anymore because they knew it was going to be you know, what, 70, 80 years until the trees were worth any money. So the state saw an opportunity and bought some land that was really cheap. Along with that land came some responsibilities to deal with those other things. I put these two pictures up there. Hopefully you can see them. And they're, they are of our district. The one is uh, Hicks Run. You can see the town, which is it's no longer there. And the other one is Dense Run. But if you look in the background, that's kind of what we're talking about. The trees, everything is brush stage, right? So in the 1900s, everything was just growing back from the, the big cut. That's when we got the land. And I, I wanna say, so that was 120 years ago, but last year, this district added at least three or 400 acres of an, another purchase. So we're not done acquiring acres. Um, sometimes there's the public sentiment for us to get more acres is like, it's not a good thing. But I think the test of time for the state forests have shown that maybe it's not the greatest feeling about adding more acres today, but in 100 years when it's protected by the people that work here now and the people that will work here in the future, it's like, hey, that, that was a bargain. We wish we could have got more. So I know I said we're not going to have a test, but if you could name one of those two guys on that, that uh, picture there, I would give you a little bit extra credit. So I bet so many people know them. Um, what makes the Elk State Forest unique? We have four natural areas and they're listed up there. You can, you can see them. Um, a natural area, let me read about that. They're, they're designed to protect certain features that are not readily available somewhere else. 
So a real good example is that in the picture with uh, two of our past leaders there. That chunk is, was designed to protect rep, reptiles and amphibians in the habitat they live in. Another good example of a natural area on the Elk State Forest is the Johnson Run natural area. And that is, uh, let me see how many acres. It's, uh, it's about 200 acres, but it's old growth hemlock, white pine, and there's some old growth hardwoods mixed in there. And I probably when you when something like that happens, it was missed. Either there was a boundary dispute or it was really hard to get to that to get those the trees cut back in the day. And now it's protected. Those trees won't live forever, but we're going to enjoy them in that state for as long as we can. So we had the four natural areas. And then we have two wild areas and a wild area is different than a natural area. So it's, it's kind of like you have to think about it a little bit. Nat, the, the wild areas are more about protecting the wild character. And they're, they're off limits to motorized uses in most cases. Um, I think the, in this case, the Quahanna wild area had a rough start. So I can, I can give you a little background that the whole area was leased to the Curtis Wright Corporation in the 1950s and it was leased for jet engine and nu nuclear research. And that's an actual picture of the facility that was there, right? Um, when they were done, that private corporation gave the Commonwealth the land back in 1966, and this became one of the, the first uh, wild area on the state forest system. So now it's about 50,000 acres of a big chunk of area that really there's no motorized, um, there's nothing going into that 50,000 acres. It does cross di district boundaries, and the Quahanna Highway bisects it, so that, you know, on the fringes there's some cars, but really it's it's meant for to be wild and to be wild forever. And then that kind of goes back to, you know, some of the rough start. The land we bought in 1900 that the Commonwealth bought was what everybody thought was just brambles and, you know, nothing good could come of it. And look where we are today. So I said, we talk about what is the elk and uh, where is it? And the next thing was the staffing. And it's not important, I, I, this is what we use, everybody's names up there. The, the important things are, there's 21 full-time people that work here and there's 14 seasonal, and a, a season starts in March and ends in around Thanksgiving. But you can see the bright yellow, at least on your screen, and those are vacancies right now. So when I say we're 21, 21 full-timers and 14 seasonals, it's been, a, it's been years since we've been to that. And we, we do try to fill those jobs. Um, a lot of them are equipment operators or they, they need a degree to be a forester or a forest technician. And we just, we saw where we work and there aren't that many people that live here and there aren't that many people that need jobs. So a lot of the times we're behind the eight ball on staffing a little bit, but uh, the other interest, there's two other interesting things on here. I think maybe different if you've seen other district presentations. On both sides, there are foresters, technicians and maintenance staff and trade staff. Uh, a lot of districts, they kind of separate them. We learned here a few years back that we, we can't continue, you know, kind of with a smaller staff than we really need. We can't compartmentalize like that. We need to work together, whether it be sharing equipment, sharing uh, ideas, uh, or even uh, person power, really. The other thing is there's two law enforcement officers on our district. So, you know, 200, 20,000 acres divided by two, they have some uh, big ground to cover. The last thing I said that you, we should talk about is, you know, the mission of the Bureau of Forestry. What do we do here? What do those employees do? I, I can read the mission. It's the Bureau of Forestry's mission is to ensure the long-term health, viability, and productivity of the Commonwealth's forest and to conserve native wild plants. There's 20 forest districts and uh, that mission is performed really differently depending on where you work. Um, if, you've, if you've had a talk with a district in the southeast or southwestern part of the state, a lot of what they do is help private landowners. And, and we do have some private landowners here too. So we try to help them if they, if they need advice. Um, but really the best way that we can perform that mission here is to manipulate the habitat that we, we work on. One of the biggest ways we do that is our timber sale program. I'm not sure how well you can read the chart, but the important thing is to know we have a goal of about a thousand acres a year of timber management activities. Uh, that doesn't mean a certain type. It doesn't mean it has to be a clear cut, 
but we, we're going to manipulate the habitat on about a thousand acres a year. And we do this, and if, if you can see, the value in millions since 1999 is added up to $69 million. So none of that comes to us. That doesn't make us proud. This is just a bookkeeping thing. But what we do realize is how important this resource is to not only the, the regular Commonwealth citizens, but also the timber industry, where certified timber gets produced here. And also, we want to make sure that what we're leaving behind is that or better. And that's a lot of what my staff does. We're, if, if we're going to do a timber sale, we want to make sure it's going to be better off than it was. And you might ask yourself, why do we need to do timber sales at all? The state doesn't need the money. That's not what it's about. Really, we're trying to balance the age class of the forest. If, if all of our land was bought in 1900 to 1910 and the trees were zero to 10 years old, they're all the same age now. And to be a productive forest, you need to have different age classes. So that's why we do it. I don't want you to think that's all we do. Uh, recently, and maybe that was all we did when I started 26 years ago, but I think we've done a lot better job now, of including native habitats, worrying about more. Back when I started, you know, everybody said it was timber and deer pretty much. But now we worry about other things and we're, we have experts on a lot of other things, luckily. It makes our job maybe a little more difficult. We can't uh, just do one thing or another, but honestly, it's a more enjoyable at the end of the day when you get involved in these other projects. One thing, so in the top right corner, you'll see we deal with invasive species, whether they be forest pests or plants. That's the spongy moth female with some eggs up there. That's been a, a real bad thing the last three years. I think we're done with it. We don't have a spray program this year, so hopefully they're gone for a while. Uh, the top left is that's, we were cutting open basking areas for rattlesnakes. So that what happens is uh, the rattlesnakes, they, they're known to bask there, but without any fire disturbance or any other kind of disturbance, the basking areas kind of get shaded out and the snakes don't like it there anymore. So to prolong their use of those areas, we go out and we help them, you know? So we're, we're into not just the trees, not just the timber, but the wildlife also. And this is my final slide. So like, it's, it's hard to talk about our forest without talking about those big animals out there standing in the cut, right? So the, a lot of this is, would be like any, any forest district in the North Central, they do, Timber management, and you can see there's a lot of uh, mature timber in the background of where they did the timber management. Kind of what makes us unique are those big mammals standing in the middle. We like them. They give us a ton of opportunity to talk to people that come look for them that wouldn't come here to visit. But at the same time, we need to plan for them. We can't have each one of them eating 10 pounds of, of uh, buds a day in our timber sales or we'll never get the trees back that we want. So. Thanks for taking the time again, and I look forward to the question and answer at the end. You're up next, right? Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Hi, everybody. My name is Sam Johnson. <clears throat> I'm a forester with the Elk State Forest. Um, I'm going to talk to you today about recreation and uh, the different forms of recreation to be had here on the Elk State Forest. Um, over the, the last few years, uh, particularly since, since COVID, uh, we've realized the importance of outdoor recreation. Um, and it's, really, it's really taken uh, center stage here at the DCNR and the Bureau of Forestry. Uh, besides being good for physical health, uh, recreation, outdoor recreation is also good for mental health uh, and for emotional health. Uh, there are also numerous economic and uh, societal benefits that come with outdoor recreation. Individuals, groups, organizations, clubs, and communities are all looking for ways to get outside and utilize the current forms of recreation that we have. At the same time, there is an ever increasing demand for enhancements to existing forms of recreation and for the creation of new forms of recreation altogether. With that being said, uh, 
staff here uh, in Bureau of Forestry, we have our, our hands full meeting those those uh, demands and challenges, but uh, they're challenges that ultimately ultimately uh, we embrace and uh, we realize how important it is. Um, so I'm gonna run through uh, some common types of recreation here uh, to be had on the Elk State Forest. I'll go through the list real quick, hiking, bike riding, horseback riding, camping, hunting, fishing, nature photography, geocaching, wildlife viewing, snowmobiling, cross-country skiing, scenic driving, night sky viewing, bird watching, and there's many more. Um, for the most part, that list, uh, they're all low impact, uh, passive forms of recreation, which means they, they pretty much utilize what nature has to offer, uh, or they utilize existing uh, trail or road infrastructure that we have already in place. Uh, and that list is not a comprehensive list. Uh, you could add a, a hundred more bullet points to that list of different types of recreation, because at the end of the day, recreation is, is what you make it. It's, it's what you choose to do when you're, when you're not working. It's what you do to decompress and de-stress and just break away from the monotony of, of daily life. Um, let's jump into hiking trails. So, uh, Hiking, that's a big form of recreation we have here, trails. Uh, in state forests, there's three categories of uh, hiking trails. State forest hiking trails is one of the categories. So across Pennsylvania, there's uh, 18 trails classified as state forest hiking trails. We have three of those trails uh, in the uh, Oak State Forest. One is in the state forest entirely. And then there's two other trails, the Quihanna Trail and the Donut Hole Trail that are multi-district trails. And we have a, a portion of their trail here. Uh, typically these are uh, premier trails. They're uh, usually of considerable length. Uh, sometimes they have historical value to the area. Uh, and oftentimes because of their length, they may require a few days to, to actually complete. Uh, district hiking trails is another category of trails. Uh, this is kind of our, our bread and butter trail. Uh, we have 30 of these in the district and uh, they can vary in length and function and difficulty. Some trails may only be a half mile long and they might be used as a connector to, to reach a, a greater trail system. Other trails uh, could be kind of more destination trails, maybe upwards of 20 miles. Uh, they may have vistas along the way or they may travel through uh, unique forested settings. Uh, for example, Fred Woods Trail is one of our uh, district hiking trails. It's four, four and a half miles long and uh, it has some really unique rock formations and a couple of scenic views. It's, it's pretty popular, especially in the fall time. We also have interpretive trails. Uh, we have two of these and they're both pretty handy to campgrounds. One's a, a state park campground and another campground is on state forest. But so with these trails, uh, usually the hiker will take a map with them and along the trail, there's a uh, designated mark stops. So you use your map when you get to one of these stops and it tells you what you're seeing basically. Maybe, maybe it's a tree identification or it's just a, a, a habitat feature that you're looking at. So you get a hike and you get an education at the same time. Equestrian trails, uh, we have the, the Thunder Mountain Equestrian Trail is, is really popular. It's 53 miles of shared use trail, so you can hike it also if you want to. You know, people come from far, far away to use this trail, especially in the fall time, because they like to ride their horses and to have the chance to, to see elk from horseback. This, this is pretty much in Benazet, Dense Run, and Hicks Run, so the, the heart of the elk range, more or less. And it also has access to our, our horse campgrounds, which I'll touch here in a second. So uh, equestrian related facilities, we have two uh, equestrian campgrounds on state forest land, Dark Hollow Campground and the Gaswell Campground. These are, uh, they're rustic campsites, uh, non-electric. They have uh, direct access to the Thunder Mountain Equestrian Trails. And they're pretty popular in the fall time. Uh, I think last year we had over 300 
uh, people come and, and stay a night or so at these campgrounds. We also have uh, or work with privately owned campgrounds. Uh, there's the Big Elk Lick and the Winslow Hill Campground, and they're both uh, located near Benazette. These are uh, different than our campgrounds. That they have more modern amenities, uh, and they also have access to state game lands and to our Thunder Mountain Equestrian Trail. These are, are really popular. Uh, I think the, the Big Elk Lick last year had maybe close to 3,000 uh, horses stay there throughout the year and Winslow Hill, maybe 1,200 some. So they get a lot of use. Biking is another form of recreation. Uh, we, in 2022, we started to develop and construct uh, the, the May Hall, a Marshall Farm uh, bike trail. So it's 12 and a half miles of shared use trail. And mostly it utilized uh, existing road system that was already in place and some skid trails. We had to build a little bit of a trail for it, but uh, it, it's in a real good spot. It's, it's close to uh, the town of Emporium here. So it's kind of connected to the community and uh, access is pretty, is, is decent for it too. It's right off of uh, township roads that are pretty well maintained. So it gets a lot of use. Snowmobiling, uh, that, that's something that I think when, I think was different at one point, uh, just because of the changes in climate, we don't get the, the weather in the winter anymore to really make a big deal about it. Uh, it's still important, but I think maybe two decades ago when you had consistent snow all winter long, this was a, a booming form of recreation. But now this past year, we had a, a week or two of, of ideal conditions for people to get out with their sleds. So it gets some use, but it's really weather dependent. Uh, Regardless, we have uh, we have 100 plus miles of trails and roads that are open to snowmobiles in the district. Uh, we have two groomers that, if need be, they'll be up and running to maintain these trails. And uh, we're we're looking ahead to the future uh, to form new connections and to lengthen our our trail systems. Camping. This is another thing that's changed over time. I remember uh, <coughs> when I was younger. You could pretty much go anywhere you wanted on <clears throat> on state forest and camp. There wasn't a, wasn't a fee or anything like that. But but now uh, we're changing over. There's a camping reservation system, an online reservation system. So uh, and it, and it's a pay system now. So there's only designated areas where you can camp. Uh, you can book pretty much a year in advance still, um, and it's a small nightly fee. But there's only certain places you're allowed to stay. There's still a primitive uh, camping, which for the most part, that's when you're hiking along a trail, usually one of our longer trails, and you're gonna do it over a, a few day period. You can still backpack and spend a night along these trails and there's no uh, reservation or fee to, to do that. Campgrounds within Elk State Forest, uh, the two equestrian campgrounds I talked about. So those are uh, non-electric, rustic sites, they, uh, they have hitching posts for the horses, uh, gravel pads to park on, um, fire rings and picnic tables. We also have the Hicks Run Campground. So that's a uh, tent and, uh, and motorized sites. So I think there's five sites maybe dedicated just to tent camping and the rest you can bring your, your pool behind or camper and, uh, and park on the pad there. Those are non-electric also. Uh, fire ring and picnic table is pretty much all you get. Uh, there's a, there is a la latrine there. Uh, we're also looking uh, 20, this, this spring, uh, hopefully they'll be rolled out, but we're gonna have roadside campsites. So these are historically, these are sites that have been used in the past for camping. Uh, they were pulled offline when we, when we switched over from the new, from the old system to the new system. But uh, there's 11 sites and uh, they're rustic sites also, no amenities. There's just going to be a, a right now anyway, there's just stone uh, fire rings. Sightseeing, that's another form of recreation. Uh, one of the most popular forms of recreation, for sure. Uh, we have the Bucktail Overlook on Mason Hill, and that's a, a beautiful view there. There's a 360 degree view 
If you're driving Ridge Road, we have eight vistas along the Ridge Road to stop and look at. Uh, 140 plus miles of open roads, open to the public, year round open, depending on weather. But uh, people are always out and about taking advantage of the site. So especially in the fall time, wildlife viewing, bird watching, elk tourism, that's, that's huge from middle of August through November. The, the area along 555 and, and surrounding areas is just packed. There's thousands of people down there every day and the weekends are, are crazy also. Hunting and fishing, that's a, it, it's probably, it's hard to quantify like it says there, but that's one of our top forms of recreation. There's, a, there's deep roots and historical use in the area. Lots of seasonal camps, lots of hunting camps. People come from from far and wide, come out of state to come here to, to utilize the land to hunt and fish. And, and also pretty much the entire state forest is open to that activity. So, so that helps too. Uh, and another thing it's, it's kind of falls into the hunting and fishing category is the popularity that's being gained from, a, from looking for shed antlers uh, pretty much from, from February through May especially elk antlers. So people come to the area hoping to find a, a antlers that elk have, have shed. And future rec projects. So we're always looking towards the future here. Uh, we have we have rec connectors that we're wanting to build to tie the town of Emporium in to the rest of the state forest. Look, we're looking for ways to enhance trails, uh, reroutes, just to make trails better, put the trails in the best possible place for people to use, uh, establish ADA accessibility for people with handicaps, disabilities, uh, the elderly, just to give people a chance, all people a chance to utilize what we have here on State Forest. And I think that's it. <coughs> Hello everyone. My name is Charlie Kirkpatrick. I'm the oil and gas forester for the Elk State Forest. And today I was asked to talk about one of our most unique tracks. And that is in the Claremont and East Branch Dam area. And it is track 986. <clears throat> for location purposes, um, this map shows where track 986 is. It is uh, east of Kane, and the closest town would be Emporium at the southeastern border. If you've ever been to East Branch Dam or Elk State Park, um, the eastern shoreline of that lake borders this tract. The tract is located in two counties. McKean and Elk, and from strategic land buying for the state, we bought this property in three different sections. The southernmost section was purchased in 1986, and the middle section, which is outlined in red, is the southern portion of the Claremont One track. And that was purchased in 2010, and that is a little over 7,600 acres. The land that is outlined in orange is the northern per portion. It was purchased in 2015 and is a little over 1,700 acres. Altogether, track 986 is nearly 4,100 acres. The uniqueness of this tract is because this ownership is divided into three owners. The northern portion of the tract has a timber reservation, which is owned by a timber Ma investment management organization or a TEMO. So what you saw in red, that timber reservation expires in 2030 and what you saw in orange, that timber reservation ends in 2050. And what we mean by that is 
the trees or timber are owned by a single entity. However, after the expiration of that reservation, they become part of the Elk State Forest. Two other things particular to this tract are we as the state forest are the surface owner. Therefore, we own the first 18 inches of soil. And the subsurface by severed rights is owned by an owner operator for minerals for natural gas exploration. And that is not a lease. The subsurface of this tract is owned. And what do I mean by severed rights? So in most cases, when you're buying real estate, the entity purchasing the land becomes both the owner of the surface and the subsurface. However, in our case, the subsurface rights are severed or separated from the surface rights, therefore forming two ownerships, a surface owner and a subsurface owner. Now, every owner has the right to be on this piece of property. And the subsurface owner has every right to extract minerals, oil and gas from the subsurface. And we as the Elk State Forest and them as the owner operator do our best efforts to work cooperatively with one another to achieve our goals. This tract has 18 unconventional locations. And each location has multiple wells on it for both the Marcellus and Utica plays. Sometimes there are up to 10 wells per location. That is not typical in the rest of the state. Most of the state, especially on leased tracks, one location will contain Marcellus wells and another location will have Utica play wells. Now with the number of locations on this site, there is a very large network of infrastructure put in place to make that product go to a market point. And that includes above ground water lines, gathering and trunk lines. There are multiple water storage facilities with one compressor site. Now with this, we do do habitat work on this track. And working in cooperation with the subsurface owner, we have overseeded many miles of these right of ways. It creates diverse habitat and ideal food sources for wildlife species, including both insects and songbirds. It provides deer with fawning grounds, bedding, and winter cover. It also provides a food source with cover rather than just providing a food source. It also creates habitat for upland game birds and small mammals, especially with partridge pea in this seed mix. And this is the seed mix that we use for this overseeding. So if you were to go to a pipeline or a right away on this track, we now have the ability with the landowner to cover the entire right of way and all other earth disturbances with this seed mix. And with that, and with all of the right of ways, we are also creating edge effect along both sides of the right of way. Some of the other habitat work that we do on this track are first entry timber harvest, creating inside forest edge, overstory removals that create early successional habitat. The harvests also create food and cover. And well location downsizing and partial rehabilitation of the site. So what I mean by that is 
once those wells are drilled and they are no longer needed to be the acreage and size that they are, the subsurface land, the subsurface owner takes part of that location and rehabilitates it. And with the right of ways, we're also creating basking habitat for rattlesnakes on the track. What the heck just happened? One second, folks, I hit the wrong button. The tract also contains nine plant sanctuaries. Now these plants may be threatened or endangered, but in most cases, they're just uncommon for our area. Somehow, in some way, their native range in our state is just somewhere else. Now, with so much activity on this on our ground, we do have to treat some of our invaders. Two of the most important ones on this tract are mugwort and goat's root. And like I said, with a large amount of traffic that we have here, it was inevitable that these invaders would show up. And these populations of these invaders are being treated on an annual basis. And lastly, this tract is so new that the recreational opportunities are limited at this time to snowmobiling, hunting and primitive camping. And there are currently at this time, no hiking or equestrian trails on this track. So with that, I'll turn it over to Joe. Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for joining us again. Uh, my name is Joe Keller from the District Forester here on the Elk State Forest. Um, I've had about 25 years with the Bureau of Forestry, some internships prior to that in the Susquehannock State Forest. I was a forest tech and forester in the Tuscarora State Forest in Perry and Juniata counties primarily, a little bit of Franklin. Um, and then I was down in central office in the Division of Forest Fire Protection and Recreation before being able to come back up here um, to my kind of my stomping grounds where I was born and raised um, here on the Elk State Forest. What I'm going to talk about today is, is one of the newer avenues or land management um, types that we deal with and conservation easements. Um, the conservation easement that I'm going to talk about is the lime timber conservation easement and the Sterling Run Track. So based on the maps that, that Wade and some of the other gentlemen have put up here today. This would be where my cursor is. This is the East Branch Dam area where Charlie was just talking about. The Hicks Run area that was alluded to about a Thunder Mountain Equestrian is down here just to the southwest of the, the Red Circle. Um, some of the other areas that we talked about, this is our Ridge, our Ridge Road area. So Sizerville State Park would be up here where the cursor is, Sizerville Nature Trail. And then the Cinema Honing State Park would be over in this neck of the woods. So I'll give you a little bit of overview. The Red Circle is actually the conservation easement I'll be talking about on the state forest. So what is the conservation easement? So the conservation easement was about 9,000 acres roughly in the Sterling Run area. Um, it is, was donated to the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania by Lime Emporium Hardwoods or Highlands in connection with two Penvest loans that they had. About 1,000 acres within this easement is actually has exclusive perpetual rights to the Portable Rod and Gun Club. In other words, we cannot have recreational um, entities or the public accessing that area for use. So the conservation easement was actually established to protect the conservation values of the property through perpetuity. So in other words, this easement is in the deed now. So it's at the county courthouse. Um, it's been recorded in the deed. So it, it goes from landowner to landowner. So if Lime Timber decides to sell the property, 
we still have the conservation easement. It stays in place, um, again, through perpetuity. The easement limits the development of the property, prohibits subdivision. It protects the scenic and natural resources. We're also able to improve some of those natural resources. This particular property has had um, sur uh, coal mining on it, surface mining. So we're in the process of working with the conservation district and the landowner to do some AMD ponds or buffer ponds to try to improve some of the streams. We're also talking about maybe doing some reclamation, full-blown reclamation in the area as well. Any forestry that's actually practiced on the property by the landowner is third-party certified. That's part of the easement. It's actually spelled right out in the easement. They have to have certification and it's, it's just like state forest land essentially. And then our low density recreation um, and dispersed public recreational uses across that landscape. How do we manage it? So DC and R will manage the easement as though it were state forest land. Um, per the terms and conditions of Act 18, which governs our, our current state forest system. Additional guidance comes from our state forest resource management plan. So again, we try to manage this property as though it looks just like state forest. <coughs> um, state forest rules and regulations, Title 17 PA Code Chapter 21 are enforced on the property. Public, and then what we do is every year, we have to, to revamp or revise what we call the public access infrastructure plan. That plan is tied to the easement. It is a revisable document that spells out exactly what we plan to do on that property, recreational wise, or to, to allow for public access into that property. It might be trail improvement, road improvement, um, picnic areas, whatever it may be. And then also it's managed under the terms and conditions of the conservation easement itself, which again is tied to the deed. I mentioned the revisable public access infrastructure plan. Um, it's developed specifically to facilitate and manage public recreation on the easement. The current plan covers roads open to motorized vehicles. Those are licensed pickup trucks, cars, that type of thing, not UTVs and ATVs. It covers parking areas, trails open to biking, major hiking trails, group picnic areas, primitive camping corridors, motorized camping areas, trails open to horseback riding, and roads and trails open to motorized recreation. Currently, within, within the easement of that list of infrastructure opportunities and uses, we only have three that we actually have open to the public. Uh, the roads open to motorized vehicles are the orange lines. This is what we call Simon's Lane. Simon's Lane covers the majority of the property, and then there's a tiny portion of Coal Hollow down here. And then also Bender Lane, which comes out to a gated road here. We have parking areas. You can see we, we have designated throughout the property. And then as, as Sam alluded to, in 2022, we started to lay out a trail system for biking and shared use primarily within this, the confines of this blue circle or this blue oval, I should say. Um, again, that was utilizing some of the, the haul roads that we had on our property and where Lime Timber has some haul roads that come over, we were able to connect them real quick. And again, we, we got about 12 and a half miles. It's been super popular with the locals here in Emporium as Emporium is just, um, just off the map here. I wanted to highlight the, the purple area here is actually Cameron County owns this property. It's the old landfill property. Um, it has been reclaimed. It's, it's in a grass, grass state right now. We've actually started discussions with them to start possibly utilizing this. Uh, Sam had a, a photo up there it had dark skies. So this is where they're talking about trying to have a grant that they're going to try to start doing some dark sky education system ses sessions, excuse me, up here. Um, so we're going to try to, what we tried to do with this property, since there's three different landowners here, our, ourselves, the easement landowner, and then the county, we're trying to do a mix of passive and active recreation. Passive would be for wildlife viewing and dark sky viewing. Active would be more so um, hiking, biking, cross-country skiing, um, and, and Sam alluded to some of those things as well. Every year we have to have an annual meeting with the landowner and their land manager. 
Um, it's held every March, April. And what we do at this meeting is we, we talk about the public access infrastructure plan, the landowners timber management activities from the past year and what they have upcoming, as well as some of the competing invasive vegetative management they may be doing or we may be doing in regards to the, the, the plan we have in place. Some of the habitat and restoration work the Keystone Elk Country Alliance has actually started doing some reclamation work in the, in the form of food plots on the property. They've actually gotten some of the, the waste sludge from Dom Tar and have been able to actually improve some of the old stripping areas for habitat for wildlife. Um, as far as ecological restoration, I mentioned some of the buffering ponds that have been put in to try to improve the acidity in the streams. DCNR, again, we, we cover our work plan and objectives through the public access information infrastructure plan, which covers specifically recreation, and then the roads and bridges. And then also in this meeting, we talk about any issues or problems associated with public access onto the property the landowner may be having. The benefits of an easement. So the acreage remains on the county tax rolls under private ownership, rather than being under state ownership where they only get the PIL um, payment in taxes and lieu of taxes. So there's a little bit better value for the, for the county as a whole. The additional lands, um, the 8,000 acres essentially are open to the public use. They're managed by DCNR as though it were state forest land. And to date, since this, this land was donated, um, to the state per that PennVest loan. And we only have about $115 per acre invested in this easement at this time. So, so far it's a win-win for, for the Commonwealth and, and the general public. So from the date of inception of this 2018 acquisition till current 2023, I'm just gonna highlight a couple things. Um, we actually administered a contract to install about 30 gates at, at about 85,000. So under the easement, any road that is currently open to the general public, we are responsible for maintaining. So what we did is we actually gated a, a large majority of the roads off because of their condition and or our ability to maintain those, those that infrastructure. As Wade alluded to, there was, I think, six or seven vacant. We're actually at about nine vacancies total right now. Um, so we, we have to figure out ways that we can kind of cut back on some of the workload that we have. So in this particular pr project that we had, we installed 30 different gates. Um, being that this was the first conservation easement, we actually worked with our central office folks to come up with the first boundary marker for conservation easements on state, state forest land that we manage. Um, so essentially, when you go around that property, it's a diamond shape. Uh, metal placard, almost like our metal ones, our circular metal ones that we have in State Forest. Today, we've installed bound these boundary tags around the property. We've also started to remove uh, posted signs. There were actually, this property was originally leased to 11 different property lessees as timber hunting or for hunting um, clubs. So we've been diligently working with the landowner to try to remove some of those posted signs. So you can see some of the other projects we've done to date. We've installed signage throughout the property. There's 50 different road signs and or parking area signs. Plus we have some interpretive signs that we've installed. Mostly at Simon and Cole Hollow Lane. We have plans to install another one at Bobble Link, which is off of Marshall Farm on the eastern side of the property. We've administered two dirt, um, dirt and gravel or DSA, driving surface aggregate projects on Simons Lane and Bender's Lane, Bender Lanes, um, at the tune of about a half million dollars total. So we had one project for 250 and another project for 250. Again, it's line, if, you, if you've been up to this property, it mimics state forest, it's a limestone uh, surface now. We also work with the county um, EMS and the landowners, uh, the, the landowner and the manager of the land lands, Three Rivers Management, to establish three LZs or landing zones on the property for their loggers and or the public for emergency response if we need them in that area. 
Under Act 26 funds, since this is, we do have vested interest in the property as the Commonwealth, we're able to use Act 26 to improve a couple of the stream crossings that are on this property. Um, the one you know, on this property in particular is the portable run that's noted down here. Um, currently that does not, it's a giant steel pipe. It doesn't have any guardrails. And we obviously don't want to have anybody driving their SUV or anything like that off into the drink. As I mentioned, the Keystone Elk Country Alliance started the food plot in 2022. And a couple of things that, that Sam alluded to were the layout of our biking trail systems and then the construction of our biking trail systems. And currently working on that particular property, we have the Lime Timbers, the, the property owner, Three Rivers Forest Management is their land manager that does their timber management. We as the easement holder, the Game Commission actually is adjacent landowner and, and they do some, some projects on there as well. The Keystone Elk Country Alliance is doing food plot and this is the Cameron County Conservation District. They're the ones that have been actually doing, been doing some of the stream um, the stream buffer pro buffering ponds and stuff like that to improve the, the quality of the streams. So that's kind of the an ease minute ball of wax. And that brings us to question and answer. All right. Well, thanks, uh, Wade, Sam, Joe, and Charlie um, for all that information. That was really great. And now I feel like I know a lot more about Elk State Forest than I did before. Um, we only have two questions in the chat right now, um, but if uh, more folks think of questions, um, go ahead and pop them in the chat and I'll read them out. Um, Sam, the first one's coming to you. It's a question about cross-country skiing and um, where the best trails for cross-country skiing are in the district and parking access for those trails. They also want to know if they're shared with snowmobiles or if they're separate. Uh, we have a, a couple of trails. Um, they're, I think they were, they were built with the intention for cross-country skiing. Uh, one, it's been in existence for a while now. Uh, this is off of... Uh, May Hollow Marshall Farm Road. So, so in the area that we were talking about before, uh, well, I guess both of the trails are, are off that road. But so the area where the the bike trail, the new bike trail that we constructed, uh, it's in the same general area. You access it via the Township Road there. Uh, one is called the Sand Springs Ski Trail, and uh, the newest one. Do we have a name? We don't have a name for it. Yet. We don't have a name for it. It's that new. It is, but, yeah. <laughs> uh, so those are. Those are our, our skiing or cross country skiing trails. Uh, they more or less just look like a, a hiking trail, but they're they're probably laid out in a, in a more uh, gentle way for to accommodate cross country skiing. You but you can cross country ski really anywhere you want. If you find a, a gated administrative road, you can go behind that and cross country ski. Um, what was the other part of that question uh, to, in relation to snowmobiles? If they're yeah, um, if they are separate or if uh, snow if they're shared shared with snowmobiles. No, they're they're not shared with snowmobiles. They're they're, they're their own thing. The one the one big thing, and I'll add this um, as far as cross country skiing, probably in the Quahanna area, we have a shared use trail system up in that neck of the woods. It's on a lot of our gated administrative roads, as Sam pointed out. It's a lot of gentle sloping um, area, but it has it's a, a lot longer in length and. Quahanna holds its snow a little bit better than the hills up around here. Um, just, just to add that. All right. Our next question is if you use the state park reservation system to um, book a campsite reservation. That is correct. So if you get in the state park reservation system, you're going to look for the Elk State Forest and then our three camping areas. So Sam mentioned Hicks Run Camping Area. That's for camping pretty much primitive only. The two equine camping, we reserve those specifically for those with horses. So they're two completely separate camping areas. So people can't camp with just their family without horses that are two equine camping is what I'm trying to say. But yeah, it's through the reservation system now. 
The next question is if you need a four wheel drive vehicle to access public access roads within the district. So no, what we consider Z1 roads or our public use roads, those are primarily or mostly limestone. There are some earthen roads in some sections, um, but they, you can pretty much use, most of our limestone roads, you could probably take a BMW on or a small hatchback car. They're in really good shape. I'm proud of the guys. They do a fantastic, our staff does a fantastic job. Um, as far as drivable trails, if there is a sign that says drivable trail, which we do not have many or very, very few, um, yes, you will need four wheel drive. So if it's a state forest road, no, you should be all right. If it's a drivable trail and it says drivable trail, you're gonna need four wheel drive. Yep. All right, um, I have a question for y'all. Since you have so many uh, vacancies right now, um, What's your need for volunteers? And if folks are interested in volunteering, how would they do so? They can contact the district office here and depending on what they want to volunteer for, we have to, so with volunteers, we have to make sure that it's not taking work from our staff, which obviously if we're understaffed, um, but you know, the more the merrier. If we have a group of people that want to come in, uh, National Fuel usually volunteers a day or two with us. I know the KTA, they have a, a crew that comes up and helps us out uh, for a weekend. So yeah, any help that we can get. Yep, greatly appreciate it. All right. Um, well, I don't see any other questions in the chat right now, and we're just at about time. If anyone else has any other questions that they think of after the fact or um, just really, really want to know, um, you can email either myself or um, any of the foresters. I'll, um, Joe, I'm planning on sharing out your email. Is that okay? That's fine. Yep. Uh, all right. Um, so I'll, I'll share out Joe's email as well. Um, and uh, thank y'all for, for coming in today and learning about the forest district with me and Thanks to all y'all for um, coming in and uh, giving a really great presentation. Thank you very much, Sarah. Appreciate everybody's Thank time. You. Thank you. Yeah. Bye, everyone. Bye